morning, everybody, and I want to say hi to everybody who's in our Woodside room, and if you're with us online, wherever you might be, we're so glad that you've come. And to everybody, I say, Happy New Year. Year. It's good to start together, isn't it? For those of you present in the 1980s, for those of you not, I'm sorry, but for those of you present in the 1980s, you might remember a little film called Back to the Future 2. It was released in 1989. And the year that uh, Michael J. Fox's Marty McFly would go into the future was what? 2015. Some of you have seen this going around the internet, right? So here's what this movie predicted. One, that there'd be flying cars on the roadway. Kind of missed that. Two would be self-tying shoes. As a dad of a five-year-old, I really want that. So somebody invent it quickly. For those of you skateboarding types, there were hoverboards. You don't need wheels anymore. There was by the second weather prediction to tell us how cold it is. And then the last one, that the Cubs would win the World Series this year. Now that last one could still happen. Well, I had somebody in the 11.05 hour or at the 820 cheer for that. So there might be some Cubs fans amongst us. You know, you might be a little bit disappointed by that list because a lot of it didn't come true. But two things that that movie did not predict. First was the internet the World Wide Web. The second thing that it didn't predict was this. Take a look at the screens. Yeah, Yeah. (laughs) right? We can clap for that. It's the little things, right? Now, how many of you unashamedly filled your car up unnecessarily just because it was under two bucks? (laughs) It's okay if you did. I cheered in my car out loud, and I'm not ashamed to admit that. You know, I love this time of year. There's so much good spirit going on. We're rethinking stuff. We're asking ourselves, taking inventory about our lives, thinking about new commitments that we want to make for the next 350-some days that we have here together. There's a lot of excitement for new, and it's all good. And what I want to invite us to do this morning is to leverage all of that excitement for new stuff, for new commitments, and just for new in general, and point it to God. Because God is all about the new, And when you hover over the scriptures long enough, you'll recognize that God's voice comes flying through to say, I am making things new. We heard that even in the song that was saying just a second ago. And what we want to do this morning is look at a passage of scripture, one of my favorite passages of scripture, and look at three dimensions of how God is all about the new, because we need to wrestle through all three of those together for all of our individual lives and our collective life together as a church. And as we do so, we'll ask two big questions. If you've not taken out your message notes, and if you find that helpful, please do that now. The first big question is this. What's new? You are new. You are new. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says this. If anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone, and the new is here. In some other versions of the scriptures, it says, if anyone is in Christ, they are a new creation. That's the intent, to get real personal. That when you trust in Jesus with all of your being, that old self is done away with, and you're now pulled along into something that's way more beautiful than you could ever imagine. It's about the new you. Anybody here uh, between now and Christmas see the movie Unbroken? A lot of us have. Uh, Maybe you've read the book. I read the book a few years ago and I didn't know the last part of Louis Zamperini's story about his faith and it just moved me to my core. Louis Zamperini is the subject of this story and his troubled youth, his Olympic pursuits, his service as a World War II bomber crewman, which included his plane crashing into the Pacific Ocean and he and two other crewmen who survived that crash drifting through the Pacific Ocean for 46 days for 2,000 miles only to be uh, plucked out of the ocean by the Japanese and tortured until, worlds, until the wars end mercilessly. This was a guy with a past. This was a guy with brokenness, and he didn't choose all of his brokenness. This was a guy that was desperate. You know, the reason why this story is so compelling for our world, I believe, is not just because of his World War II service and the nature of his story. The reason why this story is compelling and it rises above many stories like it is because in an instant, Louis was changed. Because he walked into a tent in which a young preacher named Billy Graham was telling the story about how to become brand new in Jesus 
how there was a God that loved you and how that God accepted you as is, not as you should be. And at this moment, you can come and receive him and everything changes and he came to faith. And it's a beautiful story. And for 97 years, this beautiful man, this new creation lived his life and he lived his faith for a huge chunk of that time. And that's why his story is so compelling. He's now with God. He passed away in July. Like Louis Zamperini, as is today, God is constantly nudging you and I to become new. I think that means something different for a lot of us in the room. Because becoming new, becoming a new creation, the journey of which has a trailhead, and the trailhead is this, trusting in Jesus and putting all of who you are and all your stock into him. And as we continue to follow after Jesus, it means re-upping over and over and over again to become new because in every day and in every experience, God is nudging us toward that. So the second big question is what does it look like to become new? And as we look at the book of Ephesians in chapter four, there's actually a very clear step-by-step plan. It's kind of interesting when we read it together. It says first to put off your old self. To become new means that we be about putting off the old self. In verse 22, it says, you were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires. To put off here, the phrase in the scriptures means to set aside and in many places just to get rid of. To take our old self and get rid of it. To throw it away. You know, I don't like know about you, but I, I love throwing stuff away. I love being responsible for man- managing the garbage in our home. <laughs> I know it sounds very bizarre, but there is something really satisfying when I take a bag that just is not pleasant and put it in a garbage can with a lid that closes, and then the beautiful day that I get to bring the garbage can um, to the side. And what I'm very excited to say to you is my kids have gotten caught up in this too. I have a five and a two-year-old, and there is no entertainment moment like the moment on Thursday morning when that big monster garbage truck comes rumbling down the street, and they hear the low rumble of that engine, and my kids lose their minds. (laughs) They lose it. They go running as fast as they can, competing against each other to who can see the garbage truck first. And a couple weeks ago, I got involved in that with them. It was the day after Christmas. Maybe your garbage can looked like mine. Right? It was piled up. There was stuff, maybe wrapping, maybe stinky food. If you're in a house like us, there were diapers in that that just needed to be done away with. Sorry to bring you into that, but I just, that makes me feel better. And I watched with them as this garbage truck came by and sent out that nasty claw and clamped onto the garbage can, and that garbage can rose. And it went up in the air, and then all of a sudden, we we watched as all of the content of that garbage can was like violently shaken into this truck, and then it was driven away to never be seen again. (laughs) Anybody else weird like me (laughs) in that? There's just something that's so satisfying to me. I love throwing stuff away. I love doing the laundry, too, just an FYI. (laughs) But getting rid of the old stuff, the old self, is much like that. It means to take all of what we were defined as before we met Jesus and to throw it all out. Hebrews 12.1 says, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, just getting rid of it. You know, there's this pattern of thought sometimes that I encounter, and maybe you encounter it too, that's summed up by a phrase that sometimes people say, and I've heard them say it, you know, I'm, I'm just, this is who I am. I can't change, nor do I want to change. And sometimes it gets a little aggressive and it says, so deal with it. That's nonsense. That a human being can never change, let alone that a human being trusting in Jesus Christ can never change is absolute nonsense. Because that's the beauty of the journey. We get to become better versions of who God has created us to be in every single moment. So what defines your old self? For you individually this morning, what defines your old self? Are there patterns of sin that you just can't get away from? Is there guilt and shame that weighs your shoulders heavy even as you're in this room and watching online right now? Maybe for you, as you've lived, you've picked up some labels because the reality of human life is that you live long enough, and by long enough, I mean when you get to junior high, (laughs) you get some labels. Many of those labels come from other people, 
but many of those labels come from within us. And those labels, if we let them, will become names that we own. And if we own those names too long, and if we give too much of ourselves to those names, those names then become our identity, and we believe that to be true about ourselves. What are the labels that you carry into the room with you this morning? I'm a screw up. Never gonna get it right. There's no way God could love me with all that I've done. And there's no way that I could get it right. I'm a without hope sinner. Maybe that sums up for you. Maybe you have a different one. You know, Andre Nowen writes and addresses this. He says, self-rejection is the greatest enemy of spiritual life because it contradicts the sacred voice that calls you the beloved. And it gets in the way. So what I want to invite you to do this morning, maybe even to begin a brand new effort, is to pile up all that sin. Pile up all that shame and guilt. Pile up all those labels and names and self-identifications that have been destructive for your soul and put them in a garbage can and get rid of them. If God does not define you by that any longer, then nobody has any right in your life to define you by that any longer, including yourself. Amen? Amen. God's given us a whole brand new beautiful identity. And it starts by us putting off the old self. It continues with thinking new. In verse 23, it says, to be made new in the attitude of, our, of your minds. Dallas Willard, who's a great thinker of faith in life and spiritual growth, uh, writes, thoughts are the place where we can and must begin to change. Freedom is the power to select what we will allow our minds to dwell on. And the importance of the life of the mind shows up a lot in the scriptures. Let me read you a couple examples. Romans 12, 2, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. mind. Colossians 3, 2, set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. Romans 8, 6, the mind governed by flesh is death, but the mind governed by the spirit is life and peace. Sounds pretty good. God has given you and me a very powerful tool to become new, and that's our minds. And in each of them, in yours and in mine, you have an endless river of thought that continually goes through it. Do you ever try shutting your mind off? Have you ever tried that before? Try it. Not now. Because <laughs> your mind should be here. But if you've never tried that, give it a shot. Because what you'll find is that it's pretty tough to shut off thoughts, and it actually it's impossible. Your minds are wired up that way. God has created you to be like that. Each thought carries a charge to it that can draw you closer to God or move you farther away. Each thought can draw you back to your old self or towards your new self, which God is pulling you toward. So how's the stream of thought in your mind lately? Is it about the life of the beloved and the life of becoming a new creation or is it about what's back there that you're trying to leave behind? Is it productive or is it destructive to your faith in Christ? I think the best thing that we can do here is to fill our mind with the scriptures, God's word, in order to help us to think new. So I wanna invite you maybe at the beginning of this year to consider, perhaps like you've never done before, to get the scriptures into your mind. Do whatever it takes to make that happen. It might be for you an online resource. It might be for you an app. For me, uh, it's like little simple note cards. I started this thing a couple weeks ago and I'm taking three by five note cards and writing down a scripture passage that draws me for whatever reason, and I'm punching a hole in it and putting it on this old beat up key ring. <laughs> Isn't that a really like, well thought through produced system? I wanted to show it to you, but I think it's in my car and I'm not going back out there this morning until I leave. Love you, but not that much. It's rough out there. Maybe that's your system, but whatever it might be, get God's word into your mind because you will be amazed at the results. When you fill your minds with God's word and you interrupt the flow that degenerates towards the old self and continually reminds you that God is pulling you towards something new. So it begins by putting off the old self. It continues by thinking new. And then the third is by putting on the new self. You know, what's interesting here is I think a lot of these things happen simultaneously, but as I observe this, it seems as though there's an order or a sequence implied that we put off the old, that we think new, and then we put on the new because we can't put on the new without putting off the old. 
Putting on the new self is really important. Verse 24. And to put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. Putting on the new here means to get dressed. Isn't that interesting? So here's what life with God is about in this conversation. Life with God is like walking into a fully stocked walk-in closet of the most beautiful clothes of character that you could possibly imagine. And the more that you put them on, the more that you become it. Things like compassion. That's pretty good. Kindness. Humility. Gentleness. Patience. And then love, which binds them all together. That's just one verse in the scriptures of what it talks about, how we can be clothed, how we can put on the new self. And we can do that every single day. Also, do you remember those labels? When I asked you the question, what are your labels, did something hurtful come up? Did something destructive for life with God come up? Because if so, I want you to know that when you trust in Jesus Christ, you get new labels. And actually, they go immediately towards your identity because God views you completely different. You're chosen, you're beloved, you're hidden in Christ, you're made holy and blameless, you're righteous, you're redeemed, you're included, you're gifted, you're beautiful. You are made alive with him. You are graced. You are the handiwork of God. You are citizens of God's household. You are heirs together, sharing in the promise of Christ. So when you think of who you are, who you believe yourself to be, are those the descriptors? And if not, maybe the best task to give yourself for the remainder of 2015 is to fill yourself, to fill your mind with the things that God believes to be true about you. Get rid of the old, think new, and then put on the new self, created to be like God. So what's new? You are new. When you trust in Jesus, everything changes. But there's an asterisk to it because there's, there's another dimension to it. It's not for you alone. It's meant to be shared with other people who are doing their best job to become new too. What's new? We are. We are in a collective sense. The journey of faith is not just an individual journey. It's a communal one. It's meant to be lived with other people that are following the way of Jesus in a beautiful way of both getting it right and getting it wrong and trying their best to do it better every day. God's design in a large context like ours and in a small context is that we have a circle, that we move from rows to circles because you cannot become all that God wants you to become without other people helping you to do it with God's help. You're just simply not built that way. None of us are. Wherever you find groups of people who are pursuing God and doing this beautifully messy journey of life and faith, you will find a little tribe, a little circle in, in through which God is looking to do something really, really cool. Jesus says in Matthew 18, for where two or three are gathered, there I am with them. And amazing stuff happens all the time in groups and in little circles. And I want to share a story with you right now. There's a little group of people that meet on Sunday night after the five o'clock service here at Westwood and they've been doing so for over five years. After a long journey with kidney disease, Bruce, one of the members of this group, was diagnosed with late-stage kidney failure in the fall of 2012, and a transplant would be necessary. He was placed on the donor waiting list in January 2013, but for his blood type, the wait for a donor could be anywhere between three to six years, unless someone intervened. With people in his life, Bruce shared this, including this group that he belongs to, in which he asked for a lot of prayer. And listening in that circle that night was Galen, a member of this group. And then for a significant amount of time, there were no matches to be found. On a Sunday, in between our services here at Westwood, right outside in the commons, Bruce, who serves in our parking lot, and Galen, who serves as an usher, had a conversation because God was prompting Galen. Galen asked, what's the criteria to be a donor? And he said he was willing to be tested. So then after three testing visits to Mayo, over the course of 2013, it was determined that Galen was a match for Bruce. And so Galen, in late October, called Bruce. His phone rang, and he said, green light. With open hands receiving from God, and with open hands giving away. On December 27th, 2013, the transplant procedure took place at Mayo. At first, it looked as if everything had gone smoothly, 
Bruce's body was receiving the kidney that Galen had donated to him, and Galen himself was in recovery mode. But on day two, Galen's blood pressure crashed. The surgeons opened him up again and discovered that during the transplant, they had nicked one of his bowels, and Galen's body was now infected, and his remaining kidney had shut down. He would remain in the hospital on dialysis for three weeks. And following after that, he would remain in a donation um, recovery center in Rochester for another three weeks. And then finally, after four months of recovery, the doctors cleared him to resume life as usual. The story of new physical life and new spiritual life has collided in a beautifully dynamic way, and they're all here this morning. And I want to invite them to come up to the stage and share about that. Would you welcome them? Well, guys, the first thing that I want to say is well done in your outfit today. Um, A button-down shirt with a sweater over it was a really nice choice. Uh, So thank you for joining me in that. Uh, To my left is John Waldron, whose wife is Lynn. He and uh, Lynn started this group with another couple. John, what prompted you guys to start this group? Brian, I wish we could take credit for it, but we really can't. Uh, Lynn and I have been part of a small group continuously since we got married about 30 years ago. This particular group was recommended uh, to us to lead by our, one of our wonderful staff members, Monica Held. And uh, we were able to start it with uh, great co-leaders, Mark and Sherry Kruger. So that helped uh, quite a bit as well. And we would never want to be n- without a small group. Uh, so we named our small group Join Heirs after the name of our first small group we were in as a married couple which comes from uh, Romans uh, 8.16 uh, that says that the Holy Spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God, and if children, then heirs, uh, heirs of God and join heirs with Christ. To John's left is Galen Rust. Galen and his wife Linda are a part of this group. Galen, what prompted you and Linda to jump in? Being part of a big church, we were looking to connect uh, at a deeper level with other believers, and this group provided that. We also like to grow in our faith and being able to study the Bible and other uh, relevant Christian books has been really helpful uh, also with the the help of the group. And then all the way down the line is Bruce Reimer. Bruce and his wife Kathy are here and they're a part of the group as well. Uh, Bruce, what prompted you guys to get into the group? We were looking for a group uh, to learn and study about God with people of similar age to us and also in similar life situations. Um, um, We thought it was a very good opportunity to uh, meet new people, make new friends. Great. So Galen, you heard about Bruce's need. How did you arrive at the decision to donate your kidney to him? We had been praying for Bruce, uh, for a donor for Bruce as a group for several months and there didn't seem to be any good matches initially. Um, And then, as you mentioned earlier, I had a chance to talk to Bruce one-on-one out in the concourse area and uh, asked him what it was like, what it would take to be a donor. And he said the main key was to be the same blood type. He mentioned that he was O positive and I'm O positive. I really felt prompted by God at that point to pursue it further. I prayed about it, and I decided to go get tested, and eventually was approved as a donor. So Bruce, with all the difficulty of life that you are experiencing, invite us into that moment in which Galen shared with you that he'd be willing to be tested, and then also when he called in October and said, Bruce, it's a green light. Well, it was wonderful news for him to offer to be tested because you, know, you never know if you're gonna be a match or not, so just taking the first step was, was wonderful news that there was some activity going on. Um, then when he called that evening, you know, it was just fantastic, wonderful news to, to finally get, you know, to think that, well, we do have a living donor available. And um, so I was very grateful to Galen and uh, very humbled by, by his decision to, uh, to make the sacrifice to give, to give me a kidney. And uh, just, uh, you know, our, words can't really explain, you know, the feeling of relief. So we are also very relieved, too, that... Uh, you know, with all the uncertainties and the stresses of trying to find a living donor and not really knowing how much time, you know, I would necessarily have left to, 
to go through a living donor process that uh, we were finally relieved that uh, the process was, you know, was now over. We had found a living donor. Mm -hmm. So it was really an answer to prayer. Galen, on day two of your recovery, when your blood pressure crashed, your life for those moments was really in the balance. Can you tell us more about that? When my blood pressure dropped uh, dramatically, the head nurse uh, quickly got a, head, got a hold of the, uh, the head surgeon of the transplant area and a team of other six doctors. They came quickly to my bed and asked me uh, if they could open me up again because they couldn't figure out what was going on and uh, I did give them permission to do that. So you recover and now you're here <laughs> and it's beautiful to celebrate that. Um, can you share just how has this impacted your life and your faith? I'm really blessed to have uh, full recovery and uh, spend more time with my family and, and friends. And also it's been great to see Bruce's uh, return to health, to actually uh, see him uh, do something that he really enjoys, and that's running. He read, uh, ran, I think, at least three or four or uh, five Ks this past summer, which is extremely uh, exciting to me. And Bruce, you're back to health, which I imagine is incredible. So how has this impacted your life and your faith? Well, I really feel like I've been given the gift of life and return to health. Um, I no longer always feel tired, which is a symptom of chronic kidney disease and I was having to take rest breaks during the day and just kind of take everything easy. Um, uh, after transplant, uh, exercise is encouraged to get your recovery going and also to, to help the kidney kind of function with your system. And so I was able to gradually begin to run about three months after transplant and gradually worked up to finishing some, some 5Ks this, this year. Um, I'm no longer on any dietary restrictions, so that's been welcome news. Um, I can eat whatever I want to, including chocolate, ice cream, you know, there's <laughs> nothing really out, out, outside of bounds, so that's been wonderful news. Um, for my faith, um, my faith and trust in God was really strengthened during this transplant process. Um, from the beginning, uh, I realized very quickly that I really had no control over the process. I mean, I had no way of really knowing, you know, who a donor might be, when it might happen, and so basically, uh, just realized also that I really needed to pray and, and just trust God that he would provide whatever I needed. And it turned out that, you know, everything worked out just fine. Yeah, I'm glad it did. John, for you as the group leader, what has this done for your life together as a group and your faith journey that you all have and you share? The main impact has been seeing a member of our own small group be sensitive to and recognize this dramatic and compelling God prompting and to respond to it with uh, complete obedience. And it's inspired our group to recognize and look for our own God promptings and hope and expect that we would respond with the same obedience as Galen. And isn't this a powerful story? You know, it reminds me of Acts chapter two where it says that those early followers of Jesus lived in such a way that they devoted themselves to the word and to fellowship being together and there was no one in need among them. This happened in a small group at Westwood. I just think that's so amazing. So would you join me in thanking them for sharing their story? So what does it look like to become new with other people who are on this way, this beautiful way of Jesus pulling us into who he is creating us to be um, with all of our effort sprinkled in there as well. First, it looks like us departing isolation. And I think it's only human to gravitate towards being isolated. Sometimes the thought might exist in our minds and hearts, I don't really want people to know who I am because that's risky. But I don't see isolation as a value that we ought to live in the scriptures as follower, followers of Jesus. In fact, those who became isolated usually went down some of the not so awesome paths that we see people going down in the Bible. It's moving from isolation with a desire, a simple desire of wanting to be known and to know, wanting to love and to be loved, and wanting to serve and grow in ways in which we can become more new, to give and receive according to God's rhythm for life. Second, that we but we'd be about taking the relational risk. 
Genuine relationships demand risk. It just is that way. You can't have one without the other. It's risky because we're humans, and humans are risky. We don't intend to do it, but we hurt each other. We betray each other. Yet love is found in that risk. Genuine love and genuine relationship and togetherness is in that risk. We cannot know, love, and serve and receive those things without risk. It's just not possible. So we want to give you an opportunity coming up soon to take that risk here at Westwood. In February, our group's ministry is doing a new event that we've not done before called Group Connect. It's on February 2nd and February 9th, two consecutive Monday nights in which we're hoping to launch 25 new groups here at Westwood, little tribes of people like the one that you saw earlier where we're all journeying together. And uh, you can stop outside the table here um, in our commons area. Members of our small group ministry team would love to help you. You can also find information online about this event. We want to invite you to register. We would love to set you up in a group that you will be positioned for relational success as you take that relational risk. Um, And what we ask is that you try it for two months and see what God does. And maybe you'll end up in a place where you're in a group like this. Uh, Maybe not with the same story because the marketing thing that I don't necessarily want to have is get into a group, donate an organ. (laughs) That might create a barrier for you. (laughs) But you will be given an opportunity to serve someone in a very, very profound way when you're in life together with each other. And it's so beautiful when that happens like we've just seen. So first, it's departing isolation. Second, taking the relational risk. And then third, pursuing spiritual friendship, a friendship that goes real deep. It's a friendship that helps us to grow. Tim Keller uh, writes, real spiritual friendship is eagerly helping one another to know, to serve, to love and resemble God in deeper and deeper ways. That's what this is about. And so if you're looking to grow in spiritual friendship, do it. Take a risk. Jump in. What's new? You are new. But it's not meant for you alone. It's meant for you to share it with other people who are becoming new themselves, to encourage one another to be so with God's help. But there's one more asterisk. There's one more dimension. What's new? This world is new. The whole of the world is um, a part of God's mission. His mission is big, and his mission is nothing less than to change this world and to make it as it is in heaven. And the crazy thing about that invitation is that he says to you and to you and to you and to me, I want to use you as ordinary people who call on my name to make it happen. That's simply it. He invites us to pray, God, may your kingdom come, may your will be done in this world and in my life, and may you use me to make that happen. So quick question, for you as a broad stroke of the world and even in your life, the smaller size, in your sphere of influence, in your relationships, whatever it may be, is it as it is in heaven? I think, no. It's not long before we're reminded that this world is not as it is in heaven. This this world has a long way to go. God has already had the victory, but he invites us to fight the battle. And in our worlds, there's a long way to go too as well. You don't have to have all the answers of how to do it. You just need to love people and trust God like Galen Russ did when he was prompted to be able to serve Bruce in such a profound, profound way. I want to give you a little bit of, an, uh, of a teaser for next, this next month that we'll share together. Um, when you think about the world, we think about injustice and we think about things and wrongs that need to be made right. And as a church, for the next month, we're going to be talking about that through our next sermon series. It's going to be called The Just Church. And in it, we're going to be given an invitation to make wrong things right in this world in a very, very meaningful way. So what does it mean to help the world to become new? First, it means to bless people, B-L-E-S-S. If you were here during our summer, you might remember that acrostic and that might ring a bell for you. We introduced this new lifestyle, a new strategy that we all can do to help people to come back to God in our lives who don't necessarily trust in Jesus. B is begin with prayer. L is to listen to people, their thoughts, their ideas, and their story devoid of judgment. E is to eat together because we all eat, right? S is to serve people to do something meaningful in their lives and then the last S is to share your story because what we find in the scriptures that uh, I'll read in just a second is that we all have a story of reconciliation. 2 Corinthians 5, verses 18 through 20 say this, all this is from God who reconciled us 
to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you, be reconciled to God. You are an ambassador who has a story of being reconciled to the most high God that loves you more than you can possibly imagine. And that story is not yours alone, it's meant to be shared. Bless people. Secondly, real simple, change stuff. You might like that simplicity, and I, it also might drive you nuts. But I chose that phrase with really specific intention because it's no more complicated than seeing what's wrong in the world and making it right. And we get that opportunity every single day to pray, God, your kingdom come, your will be done, to my life, to my relationships, to my systems. Systems matter to God because people are affected by systems and people matter to God. It also means praying, God, your will, your way be done in my work, whatever it may be, because what you do for 70% of your waking hours matters deeply to God and he wants to use you as a vessel to bring the kingdom even to that environment, as crazy it may sound for some of us. It means to bless people. It means to change stuff. Trust in God and watch what he'll do. So what's new? You are. But it's not meant for you alone. It's meant to be shared with other people who are doing this beautifully messy journey of life and faith together as you change the very world that you live in. Everything's new. And God gives us the gift of being a part of it. And I think there's no better way to end our gathering this morning than to come to the table and be reminded of the profound gift of new life that Jesus gives us in his sacrifice, in his death and his resurrection. And so if you have not yet put your trust in Jesus, I pray that you'll know that God loves you so deeply that you'll never be able to fully fathom it as you are right now, not as you should be. And that he would want nothing more in the beginning of this new year than for you to just simply say, Jesus, I trust in you. Lead my life, pull me into that new self that you have waiting for me. And for all of us who have said, I trust you, Jesus, and are walking with him, this is our opportunity to re-up and to say, Jesus, thank you, to bring all of our sin, all of our shame and guilt, all of who we are right now in this moment to God and to say, God, make me new. So as we come to the table, let's pray together. God, we can't thank you enough for being a God who is as powerful as you, a God who as significantly holds the entirety of the universe in your palm as you do, and yet cares so deeply for every single one of us. Our minds will spend all of our lives trying to fathom what that means, but yet it's true, you love us. In every moment of our lives, in different meanings for each of us, who are here, who pray together, you give us that invitation. And so for those of us in this room who might be in a place where you want to begin this journey of faith, just say these simple words with me. God, I bring myself to you as is. And I'm broken. I believe in you and I trust you to pull me into the new self in all of its beauty and wonder that you want to give me. I believe in you. And for those of us who are continuing this beautiful journey, God, we ask that you would invite us to recommitment even in this time, that in this new year, that you would remind us of just how new we are and just how beautiful the identity that is that you have for us. And as we take of this moment, as we experience it, may you meet us and reach us yet again.